Uh, I'm James Griffin. I'm a digital infrastructure developer at the Princeton University Library. And uh, today I'm going to be addressing the topic of synchronizing some Vero repositories. So really to provide some context for this presentation, I'd really just like to walk through briefly exactly what a repository is, why, why one builds one within an organization. Um, this will obviously not be in depth. But essentially, for the purposes of this discussion, within an organization, what exactly does a digital repository provide? Um, we can look at this as a service that publishes assets, uploading, sharing things from our users, uh, describing things, content curation, uh, organizing things into collections, something comparable to digital asset management, uh, finding things, it can serve as a discovery platform or at least have discovery features, uh, as well as saving things. In many cases, we would like our repository to also serve as a digital preservation platform or to integrate with one. Now, one would identify these requirements within an organization and presumably one would develop a platform to meet these needs. So how would one approach actually developing this? Again, if we need a simple but expressive language, a reliable and robust framework, something that's really heavily community driven, one can use Ruby on Rails and Samvera. Let's build a repository. So seven months pass, our repository is fin it's finished and it's released. Curators can manage their collections, subject specialists can catalog their items, reference librarians can use this repository as a new resource for discovery and assisting patrons, uh, and generic users can browse each item and search for content, successful deployment, ship successfully. Two months follow. We're still running this single Rails application in production and now we're finding that our subject specialists need new controlled vocabularies for some of the content that they've just ingested into this repository. Our curators need a customized user experience for their collection that they happen to manage. And our reference librarians need enhancements to the discovery interface because they're just not complex enough to meet the needs of librarians who need more advanced search features. Our response is typically going to be just to extend the existing code base, extend the app. One year follows. Again, we're now gonna find ourselves in an even more difficult situation. Curators need yet another custom user experience for a new unique collection in this repository. Reference librarians are now finding the repository slow even though it meets their needs. And subject specialists have new content to migrate into the repository when we can get to it. Furthermore, we also need to update the repository to the latest Sunbury gems. And we could still only extend a single app or modify a single code base in order to address all of these action items. We can add a new server to our cluster or redeploy a second instance of this Rails application. We could scale this out horizontally. We could also hire a new developer. Perhaps that will speed up the rate at which we can modify and extend the code base. Or we can throw something like DevOps at this where we can try and use some sort of cloud-based technology where we can perhaps instantiate more virtual servers, try to vertically scale at least some components of our stack. But we're, again, we're still funneling at this point of having a single Rails application that we deployed on individual virtual machines or physical servers. So these problems really aren't all that new to web development, right? I mean, these really arise from an approach that is often described as uh, implementing a monolithic system architecture. And there are a myriad of alternative architectural patterns that one can implement in response to these scaling issues. Um, some of these phrases are probably familiar, some of them are a bit old too. Uh, Service-oriented architecture, distributed object architecture, um, message-oriented middleware, um, uh, decomposing into microservices. For anyone who's been um, paying attention to the work Stanford has been undertaking with TACO, that's particularly relevant with the work that they've been successfully um, taking ahead. Um, but unfortunately, you know, a, a lot of these phrases can be nebulous. A lot of these terms can be nebulous. They can also be used as buzz phrases. And oftentimes, these are, are domains that overlap. Uh, for example, service-oriented architecture is really almost more of a, of a paradigm of architecture. I mean, you can offer uh, message-oriented middleware within an SOA-compliant approach to implementing how you scale out your systems. Um, so it, it's not as if each of these are mutually exclusive. Uh, for those of you who are interested in this from a more theoretical standpoint, I would also highly recommend you check out uh, 
Gregor Hope's and Bobby Wolf's book, Enterprise Integration Patterns. They kind of go through a lot of these patterns in great depth. But getting back to distributed architecture, how can we distribute a system architecture? It's a, it's a fairly large topic, way beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, it actually doesn't even relate simply to web applications or web systems that we have deployed. Um, so there are a number of different standards and protocols that allow us to basically begin to scale out different components within a given architecture. So you could begin to actually take instances of objects and instantiate them and then pass the instances themselves over the network. Um, there are some protocols out, uh, standards out there, some libraries that support this, uh, something known as DRuby is one Ruby enthusiast might have heard of here. Um, you have web service standards that allow basically our, our, our apps to begin, begin to talk to each other uh, in a way that's, that's more descriptive. Um, in, in a machine readable language, they can basically describe what each web service endpoint does. We have different messaging protocols which can tunnel um, over the, uh, which can tunnel over the TLS for security, but also they typically operate over TCP or even HTTP in some cases. And the very common case are just RESTful services, where you'll have one app making a RESTful call to an, a call, excuse me, to the RESTful API of another app, getting a response and responding accordingly. Um, we're only going to focus upon distribution using messaging protocols during this presentation, but it should be noted that there are many other approaches here. So getting into messages, um, what do I mean by a message? It's just data describing an event that happens to take place within our ecosystem within a given application that you want to scale out. Um, the payload for a message typically contains metadata about an event. For example, say within a repository you have an event, Alice updated file set ID number at this date and time on this server, this repository server within our cluster. This is an event that we would want to capture and we want to transmit some data about this event so other services that might respond accordingly would be listening to this and, uh, and parse this information. Um, so when you're taking this type of an approach, what we're discussing is services publish messages. Um, they also listen for messages. Uh, the messages themselves are stored in queues and services only access messages using these shared queues. This is going to become a lot less abstract in a moment when I actually get to the technology that enables this. Um, so briefly, there are some protocols as well that are worth mentioning here. Um, basically, not everything has to necessarily be text-based. It can also support binary. Uh, Stomp is kind of a, a more antiquated protocol, but it allows you to kind of structure your messages using key value pairs, kind of like hashes or dicks in the Python world. Um, the advanced message queuing protocol has much more support. It basically allows message payloads to actually be um, binary payloads. And it also defines uh, exactly how queues can be accessed by multiple clients when it comes to exchanging and sharing these messages between different web services. Um, so, all right, we've discussed what a message is. We've discussed a bit about the protocols around the, that have been constructed around sharing these. Um, now, we discussed queues a bit. But sharing queues between different web services is a bit difficult still. We oftentimes need a dedicated service just to actually act as sort of like a, uh, a middleman or a, a, an intermediate service that fields requests from different services trying to access the queues. Uh, this is known as a message broker. And typically, we follow something known as a publish and subscribe pattern in which services publish, publish messages to queues through the broker. Um, in cases, there are cases where services can publish to multiple queues. This is known as a fan out. Um, and services will also access the queues by subscribing through this same broker service. So it gives us a bit of a bottleneck still, but it actually gives us the ability to scale out the different queues that our different services are listening to. So getting to the technology, there are a number of brokers that you can support. Um, you know, many of you are probably familiar with the number of these services. Um, and there are plenty, to, I'm not going to enumerate uh, even this list. Um, we're only going to be discussing RabbitMQ today. Uh, this is what we use currently in the Princeton University Library. It implements this advanced message queuing protocol referenced earlier. But there are alternatives even within the repository community. Uh, Island Orc Law uses something known as Alpaca, which uses um, Apache Camel routing. Um, as a form of middleware. And um, Apache Kafka and tr I believe Trellis LDP 
um, as something that is uh, actively using Apache Kafka for messaging. Um, for those who are unaware, Trellis LDP is sort of uh, an alternative, an alternate implementation of Fedora 4. Um, Rails 2 kind of gives you something of a solution out of the box known as Active Job. Um, it doesn't quite get as far as offering, offering integration with message brokers, but it does give you this kind of queuing based approach where you take jobs that you want performed at a later date asynchronously and you push them onto a queue and they get, they get done. And anyone listening to that queue could presumably be informed when these jobs are finished. Okay, so getting into what wrapping in queue is um, how, and how you use it within Ruby, there's a gem that we typically, that we use called Bunny. It basically provides an API to this rabbit NQ service. Um, it's relatively straightforward. I mean, you basically connect to it. Um, you operate on something known as a channel which allows you to access a shared queue. And you can see here, using this client, you can publish these messages and um, using this queue interactively as you would a normal queue style uh, class in Ruby, you can basically pop off of this. Relatively straightforward. Um, it's really um, fun to play with just to, to get a, a less conceptual grasp of a lot of this and how it works. Um, how we typically use this in our Rails applications is we actually wrap this within a service object uh, messaging client where we actually wrap the, um, the publishing operations within a method. So we'll typically uh, say invoke a, a generate message, message method along with the status and the model that's being published and then we publish that message to the exchange. We handle any errors uh, that are encountered during the process and uh, to give you an example of how this could be closely integrated with a standard active record object, I'm going to take the, uh, the user class from a s typical Hyrax application and I'm going to use, uh, for those who worked with active record transaction callbacks, so basically what you can do is you can hook into the, um, the, the persistence of the object where once we can be certain that an object has been um, created or updated within the database uh, or deleted, of course, you can actually listen in and wait for this to this database level operation to complete and you can publish an appropriate um, message in response to RabbitMQ. So other, other services listening can respond to this accordingly. Um, now, we've gone over publishing messages to RabbitMQ. Um, when it comes to subscribing to messages and actively listening for any updates that our apps might be pushing out there into our ecosystem, uh, typically we have to run a different gem known as sneakers. This is due to the fact that Rails isn't concurrent, doesn't really support concurrency, so you can't spawn a new thread and just say, okay, we're going to start listening for new updates from our other Rails applications in our network. We typically run um, a series of, of Redis workers in the background that listens, listen for updates and basically um, respond accordingly depending upon the context of the updates and which app's actually listening to these. Um, so, I mean, integration for this is still pretty straightforward. Um, you typically just implement a worker class that has a mix-in and you override a single method that basically ensures that it returns a certain result um, based upon whether or not the processing of the payload is successful. So the idea here is basically that uh, Sneakers Worker API provides you with some methods that you override and you, you find out that the message that your Sneakers Worker received from RabbitMQ is somehow faulty or bad. You throw a rejection, otherwise you acknowledge that you received the message. Um, the sneakers workers themselves are run on the command line. It's fairly straightforward. It's just a bundle exec rake sneakers run command and you'll see a whole bunch of output. Um, it's, it's really, again, it's kind of like the, the bunny gem. I would highly recommend that if you have the opportunity to experiment with it, um, definitely, definitely take, a, take a look at that. So getting into um, an actual case for how you would integrate this with a Somvera repository. Um, so we at Princeton use Valkyrie to implement a repository known as Figgy. Um, so this is going to be a bit challenging for those who are unfamiliar with, with Valkyrie's architecture, but basically Valkyrie uses change sets to persist new or updated properties to repository objects. Change sets are persisted using a change set persister. There's a, a lot of documentation on the Valkyrie wiki detailing this. 
Um, basically, what we do is extend the change set persistor, and um, I'll get to that in a moment within the code base in order to, to publish any updates that we have that we have for modified, new, or deleted resources in, f in the Figgy repository. But really, the best demonstration for a lot of this is um, to look at how we synchronize Valkyrie at our institution and Geo Blacklight. So basically, how would one update a Blacklight catalog using repository messages? In other words, say we happen to be ingesting some scanned maps into our repository for preservation. We want to apply some metadata for the, for the objects within our, our repository, but we want to actually take that data and push it out to a Blacklight instance, in this case, Geo Blacklight, because we're dealing with geospatial assets. Um, how does sneakers make this work? How does Bunny make this work? I'm going to run through a demonstration in order to showcase this. Okay. So uh, we use a Voyager. We use Voyager in order to manage all the metadata that we ingest into our catalog. So I'm just going to draw all of our metadata. We're going to create a new scanned map. We're going to pull in all of our metadata from our catalog, pre-populates there. Um, now, r business rule that we have in our repository is that if we don't provide some geospatial extent for a scanned map, we don't actually let it sync with GeoBlacklight because then it could be located anywhere on the planet. So this is Gavin's point down. And we're just going to zoom out a bit, select that area. So now we have our bounding box, our geospatial extent here. We're going to add an image. Just to warn you, I'm using something that's like really, it's, it's not the actual asset itself. It's a really lightweight geo tiff, but will get us through this presentation. Okay, great. It's gone ahead and processed. Now, so that's Figgy. That's how you basically get a scan map into the repository. Uh, so this is our implementation of Geo Blacklight. Um, from the landing page, you basically have the ability to browse all. And we have right here a total of 20 items seated in the, the, local, ins the local instance I have running on my MacBook. Uh, so we want to publish this. We're going to put it through our workflow. Lead it. Okay. And now we're going to take a look. And now we have 21 results. Oops, sorry. Okay, we'll see. You see it's the same geospatial extent that we had in our repository, so we know that that's synchronized properly. And you'll see we can now actually access the same IIIF manifest. So that data has been synchronized over. All the metadata that we want exposed through GeoBlacklight has been synchronized over. Um, and basically, this is what a lot of this message-oriented middleware allows you to do. Right? So from here onwards, we're no longer locked into a position where, say, you want to be, be able to provide your repository users with the ability to search uh, along this, you know, certain coordinate guidelines or basically just using a map. Well, this type of interface is something that you can reserve for your GeoBlacklight instance. They get their own unique user experience here. And you don't actually have to go back to modifying the um, Valkyrie, in this case, the Figgy repository interface. We have a relatively simple and straightforward discovery interface here. But our end users don't need to access this because they're not actually necessarily going to be editing any of, any of the metadata here. We just want our primary users to be able to come in through GeoBlacklight. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, we're not just propagating messages through RabbitMQ that allow us to publish synchronization, but we can also go ahead and flag this as takedown. And you'll see now that previous entry no longer exists. 
And if we go back, we're back to 20 results. So we haven't even necessarily deleted this from the repository, but you can actually condition upon um, you know, the workflow state. In this case, we've marked it as taken down rather than complete in order to keep, in order to send out another message letting GeoBlackLight know, okay, de-index this from your solar. And this way, you're able to actually begin to control the flow of content out to other services that might be listening. Should briefly mention that if you wanted to undertake implementing support for this uh, with Hyrax, it wouldn't necessarily be too difficult in undertaking. Um, you just basically need to implement uh, a relatively straightforward new actor, a messaging actor in the stack. Um, I actually, if you reference my slides, I have an example of this on GitHub. And just in case um, this Outstanding PR gets merged. I know that Tom Johnson, the tech lead on Hyrax, wants to destroy all actors. Um, what I'm doing on GitHub is actually a lot of uh, monkey patching based off of his work. So I'm sure that he's going to restructure a lot of what he's been doing. But basically, if one looks, you can go ahead and actually see that you can just override some steps where I've just managed to inject my own step into based off of called publish create message where I'm going ahead and I'm basically just calling a base class that goes, that goes out and calls our messaging client every time a Hyrax work happens to be created. With the understanding that in time when Tom establishes a pattern for supporting operations like updating, destroying, we would follow this type of pattern and you would implement additional steps to dry transaction operations, which would go ahead and basically uh, publish RabbitMQ messages accordingly or whatever you happen to have listening. So I don't know. We eight minutes for questions? Yeah, eight minutes for questions, great. <coughs> yeah. Uh, I was just curious how you guys in practice handle uh, the, the idea of either your message broker going down or uh, failed tasks happening, like how you keep those going, number of retries and, and whatnot. Just like what that looks like in practice for you guys. In practice right now, I believe that we have our RabbitMQ message service running at least on, we have it running on are at least one production server with a number of different, with our slaves distributed between each Rails app. So it's kind of like, if we've gone ahead and we basically, um, we, we do have a central point of failure, I believe, where we have a, a RabbitMQ, we, we actually have the, the service daemon running and uh, on, on the, I think it's the Figgy production node, but there are additional worker nodes that are, are running alongside of side, using Sidekick these Redis workers that are basically running in parallel with one another, feeding off of the same queue. Uh, when it comes to the details as to how many retries we permit and things along those lines, um, I actually don't know the specific number that we permit. So, uh, sorry. As you were entering that object into Figgy, I noticed that you chose a bounty box uh, the specific geospatial object that you added. Could you choose coordinates instead? Yes, certainly. I, I mean, um, these bounding boxes, I think it's, uh, if there are two different formats that are permitted um, that can be parsed by solar to, to provide the kind of um, spatial querying functionality that gives you the, the geo blacklight browsing interface. Um, one is specific to solar formatting where you can just pass like, like it's kind of like a, a tuple of, of just coordinate pairs. Um, and you can also pass a well-known text. But I think that if you're looking to kind of pass well-known text, it's kind of, you, they limit you to just uh, bounding boxes and points. And solar itself, I think, just gives you bounding boxes po and points, uh, um, or Geo Blacklight does. Uh, I know that there are, there's some way of configuring this to kind of go beyond that and, and handle polygonal boundaries. But I don't think that there's actually anything beyond the solar backend support for that. Like, I don't think that at the Rails level, when it comes to dealing with Geo Blacklight, you can query for anything that complex. And can I ask a follow-up question? 
the change in GeoBlacklight was pretty quick. I mean, I, I understand these are both running on your machine. What happens behind the scenes exactly? I think that I should have it in my terminal. Yeah, it's not too human readable, and I don't know if I can get anything out there that quickly. But right, so I can reference the code base. It might be a bit more clear here. But essentially, so all right, I made this reference to a, a Valkyrie um, aspect of architecture known as a change set persistor. Just think of that as kind of like uh, something within Active Fedora if you're working with Hyrax. Uh, basically, change set persistors are going to go through, going to offer a number of different steps that are undertaken whenever a resource is persisted. Uh, so within Figgy, we do a lot of things to our resources um, before they're saved, um, after they're saved, and things like this. Um, we have something here, a callback here known as after save commit. It's um, pretty much analogous to the active record uh, transactional callback that I referenced earlier, where we're publishing a message based upon the operation that we're, we're undertaking uh, within this change set. So we're going to call uh, our publish message factory, going to try not to wind through the code too much, but let's say we're creating a new, new object as we just did. So we're going to instantiate this class. We're going to go through and we're going to tell our messenger uh, member object that we've just created a record. What's that doing? Uh, it goes through a few things. And it goes down here, and we're basically going to end up in this class GeoBlacklight Event Generator, which publishes a message to our Rabbit Exchange right here. So this is all from the Figgy publishing endpoint. It's just a lot of complexity wrapping, wrapping around that bunny gem. For subscription, we're going to be going into our workers. Here you have our GeoBlacklight Event Handler. There's your sneakers worker that I referenced earlier. We wrap that around some other service object that we delegate a uh, GeoBlacklight event processor, which in turn is going to basically take the message that you receive from RabbitMQ. So the message itself is just simple JSON for us. And we're basically looking in, into the, you know, the um, value that we've keyed to the event string. And if it's been created, the, if, if GeoBlacklight here is through sneakers, I'm, th I'm sorry, from RabbitMQ via sneakers that we've created a new resource. We're going to call this class update processor. And what this do is basic, what this does is basically allow GeoBlacklight to take the JSON from the, um, take the JSON that we've passed in RabbitMQ, transform it into a solar document, and index it into itself. So we're kind of passing around these solar documents to kind of provide this functionality to Geo Blacklight and, and potentially other Blacklight instances. We actually do it with something else too, uh, but that's also Blacklight based, so it's a very similar process. Um, I just have a question regarding the RabbitMQ. Um, in our institution, we have lots of Python middle tier scripts that, that were written long, long ago, so we are still migrating things. And while we have the Sophia implementation currently, which we're maintaining and equivalently developing Hyrex applications. Uh, we, we use RabbitMQ in Sophia, and the problem we have found is that because there is already Python code which is wrapped with Celery, right. we have found a lot of problems trying to fine tune the messaging between the RabbitMQ and the Celery servers, especially like hard coding things between each other. Uh, so we're actually thinking of just going back to rescue is an easy option. Yes, I mean, I have no experience working with Celery as a framework. But from what I understand, it, it, it's probably opinionated with how you're passing messages into RabbitMQ, or at least that's what I would assume. So I would think that you would need some sort of a lower level client in order to get around much of the, the issues that you're, you're encountering. What exactly are you sending in the payload of the messages, if I may ask? It's, it's some kind of a hard-coded string that Celery needs it to put it into the right queues. Oh. So uh, we have lots of workers, Python workers. There are other services which are written in Python, and all of them send it to different queues. And yeah, the workers are written in Python in some case. Oh, OK. Understood. So, yeah, so in order that those workers understand where the source is coming from, in this case being Sophia or Hyrax, 
So we had to hard code for it to understand where the source is. So I, I think it's probably the Q, uh, it's an alphanumeric digit with like 10, 10 digit characters or something. I mean, I know we typically use an exchange-based approach to broadcasting what we're doing, which basically, as I understand it, it allows for, for great and late, greater latency in terms of uh, permitting access to the messages, but it also allows us to kind of share our cues more readily. I, I, it sounds to me like, the, I know that there's also an alternative approach that's topic-based, okay. which is kind of closer to what you experience in the Java world, where they do a lot of message uh, broker service integration as well. I don't know, maybe there's something there that's in conflict. I don't, I don't know, I, I, I wish I had more, uh, uh, I had any guidance for you, sorry. That's fine, thank you, cheers. All right, that's lunchtime. Thank you so much, James, that was great. Thank you.